Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming to our presentation. Uh, fair warning, Joe and I have already been to the gym several coffees deep and gotten a couple rants going, so we are going to stay fairly close to what we've written, but but we'll probably go off, off script at some point. Uh, we, uh, our, our goal for this presentation is, at some, let me see from the crowd, who has a, a qualified strength coach and adequate enough facilities to use with your team on a regular basis? Okay, who is lacking one of those things or you're responsible for it yourself? Cool. So we are going to try to address, that's actually uh, more from the first crowd than I thought we were going to get. Um, what we're trying to do is provide resources for strength coaches to learn more about rowing so that they can write better strength training programs for rowers. We can get people strong, but can, can we help build better rowers in the gym as well? And then we're also trying to provide resources for rowing coaches to be able to learn more about strength training and, and improve strength training practices. So we're going to try sort of throughout the presentation to be addressing both as we go. If you've got like a quick clarifying question or, or if something's not clear on the slide, please feel free to ask, but otherwise we'll, we'll hold the longer questions until the end. We've got about an hour of material and then we'll have plenty of time afterwards uh, to talk more. Uh, so briefly, just a, a little bit about myself. Um, so I'm a full-time strength and conditioning coach. Uh, I work at uh, Lawrence Memorial Hospital uh, Sports Performance and Physical Therapy Center. Uh, so during the week, I'm working with middle school up until about 85 years old and in between, um, all different sports uh, across the board. Uh, and then a lot of individuals also out of, out of rehab as well. Um, I'm also the head strength and conditioning coach for the Portuguese Rowing Federation. Uh, and then this summer I was named to the M Missouri State Advisory Board for the NSCA. So that's mostly just in case you forget which one's which, we got the pictures there too. Please Joe and Will. Uh, we will just sort of move it along, so. With Joe and I, just to give a little backstory, this is actually the first time we've met in person. We started working together about three years ago. Uh, if anybody listens to the Strength Coach Roundtable podcast as an offshoot of the Rowing Chat Network, uh, that was how we started, just around these conversations of how we can get more strength training resources into the, the rowing training community. So it's fun to be able to do this in person for a change instead of on how many opposite time zones we've been in over, <laughs> over the years. Uh, this is our other co-host, uh, Blake, Blake Gourlay. And Blake does a great job with this quote. I, I dubbed this Twitter coaching at its finest um, of, of setting up sort of the big picture for why strength matters in rowing. So if we increase strength, we decrease the effort required per stroke, and we improve endurance at submaximal intensities. So rowing requires a certain amount of force per stroke. In the research, this can be as low as 60 pounds um, and as high as 160 pounds, depending on the kind of boat you're rowing, uh, how exactly you're rigged, what competitive category you are. There's a lot of things that change it. But, but the basic idea is that if we're going to row for a, a certain number of, of minutes or a certain number of meters, we need to be able to generate some maximal force uh, consistently and, and repeatedly and with some times of higher stroke rate and, and, and higher load, starts, sprints, uh, power tens in the middle, but then mostly that sub max load. So if, if, if 60 pounds or 75 pounds or whatever your stroke force is, is a relatively high percentage of your max, it's going to be really hard to maintain that as a sub max intensity. If we could build your force capacity and make your peak force higher, then the sub maximal force is going to be easier to maintain. And so that's sort of the, the, the dual sides of it from a performance perspective is improving not only your peak force for those start sprints and power moves, also your submax force at base intensities. And then a lot of what we do with, with strength training for rowing uh, is about building up the muscles and the movements that rowing alone neglects. Here's uh, another piece from Ed McNeely who's done some research on this. And Ed says, ba based on his research, that, that your 2K pace should be about 55% of your peak power. So that's again illustrating that if your peak isn't high enough, it's going to be hard to get the submax high enough. And so I've illustrated with this how, how some of those break down. That this is at, at a six-minute pace. You're, you're going to have to hit about 275 for your average. So if that's 55%, then your peak needs to be about 855. And so he, he did this, I think, a 200 drag factor, 10-stroke dead stop. Try it yourself. This is a nice way that, that I'll use in my coaching to see if, if, if this is a limitation of peak power uh, and that 55% is not high enough or if it's more of an endurance issue, if the peak's really high, but, the, but their base pace is, is relatively low. So that's the performance side of things. And then if you were in my low back pain and rib stress injuries talk, we already talked a lot about this, or if you're coming tomorrow when I do it again, uh, reducing injuries has a performance enhancing effect too. 
because it's more rowers available, it's more practice time, it's more bodies there for fundraising, recruiting. Uh, so we're both big on this dual role of strength training of both improving performance and reducing injuries as, as a yes and, not an either or proposition. Okay, so uh, I'm going to outline um, some of the principles and then provide some examples through the next several slides. So principle of individuality. So um, regardless of what exercises you're choosing to do with your athletes, you want to take the time uh, to get a little bit more specific. So respecting the individual. So a good example would be for, say, your squat or your deadlift, the foot position for that athlete. So you want to take into context uh, and respect their, um, their anatomical structure, their bone anatomy. Um, so simple thing that you can do with your athletes is to do either a hip sc scour or a pelvic rock test. So, for example... If you're doing a pelvic rock test, you get them down into a quad, quadruped position, start narrow, okay, feet together, toes untucked, and you're going to hinge backwards, bringing your hips towards your heels, and what you're looking for is where the, the hips and the sacrum or the low back break, okay? So you're going to start here, narrow base, rock back, and as soon as that tailbone starts to tuck under, you're going to have them stop. And then you're going to go wider. And the idea is, is you want them, them to maintain a neutral spine all the way through and see how deep they can get, right? That's going to allow you to set how wide they should be. This is, for, for lifting, it's probably going to be a little bit wider or significantly wider than the foot plate on the erg or in the boat. Okay? So, again... We'll start with two times width of where I was before, okay? Just pushing back slowly, all right? And how much deeper I can get in that position, all right? Then I would have the athlete just keep their feet right there, tuck their toes, walk back, all right? And then from there, just have them do some body weight squats. So let me just kind of face you. Just have them start off with their feet straight ahead, okay? And watch where their knees track, so are they able to maintain alignment, that type of thing. All right, and if, so my right foot wants to turn out, like it's already, it's already starting to move that way. So I'm gonna just kind of respect that, okay, and allow my foot to turn out a little bit more. Because I want the athlete to be comfortable in their hips, all right, and then just squat down, all right. And that's what we're looking for. So one, we wanna make sure that they're in a good position that is respectful of their anatomical structure too, that they're comfortable, right? Because they're going to be under load, whether you're doing, you know, uh, anterior loaded goblet squat type variation or back squat, that type of thing, right? Anything to add? Yeah, so sort of the pattern from here as Joe goes through these principles is going to be tying in a couple specific lifts. Um, again, understanding that everybody's got a slightly different level of athlete, equipment situation, uh, programming stuff. We're going to introduce some of these physical movements. A lot of what we do with rowers does not feel like rowing and we have to work against this mindset that that strength training needs to feel like 500 meter repeats or lactic work or you might as well not be doing anything uh so a lot of what we do with rowers particularly junior rowers uh starting out is more movement literacy based and more on can we get these fundamental movements locked down so that then the athlete can start to apply those lessons that they're learning on land to on water so as we go we've got a couple more examples for that, but just be be thinking about how we can use strength training to support rowing, not mimic or simulate rowing, because we do different things with different modes. Uh, so next principle, so principle of specificity. So breaking down the the rowing stroke, um, you know, on the drive phase, we've got a lower body push followed by upper body pull, right? So from a strength and conditioning standpoint, we want to make sure that we're having good balance between the anterior, the front side of the body, and the posterior side. However, it is a posterior driven sport, so we want to make sure we're taking time to really develop good posterior strength. So your hip hinge type patterns, your deadlift are going to have good carryover, good hamstring development um, is going to be important. Also, a lot of Will's work that he's done, uh, research reviews, and tying into low back, reducing injury um, risk. Having good hamstring strength is, is going to be a key component of that. Um, 
So those are just a couple quick examples in terms of being specific, tying over to tr good transfer for the sport. Very simply, uh, progressive overload, okay? So to make progress, whether we're talking on the rowing side from a training standpoint, right? The variables that we're going to be manipulating probably the most are going to be volume or intensity, um, and then you also have frequency, okay? So to get adaptation, you, you have to incur some stress. And equally, you also have to back off and give your body time to recover fully to raise your fitness level, all right? Um, so to do that, those are the variables that you're going to manipulate. So on the strength and conditioning side, you're looking at volume on a week-to-week -week basis, okay? So increasing the number of repetitions they're doing. It could be load, so the weight that they're lifting, okay? The other ways to do it are you can also kind of manipulate the amount of rest, all right? So then you're looking a little bit more kind of at work capacity. So say you're taking one to two minutes of rest in between sets. Over time, that athlete can do that same amount of work, and they're only taking 20 to 30 seconds of rest. But the perceived rate of exertion for them is the same, all right? So that's another way, very simply, to gauge if you're getting stronger and fitter. It just takes less time for you to be able to recover in between sets. Okay, uh, progression. So again, tying back into some of those that I mentioned right there. Um, building into uh, the, the principle of overload, these kind of overlap a little bit. So as the athlete is making uh, adaptations and getting stronger, in terms of overload, you also have to add complexity. So over time, all right, you're going to have to make the exercises more challenging. So that can be going from a bilateral stance, like a two-legged squat or a deadlift, to a single-leg variation, okay? So now you're adding in a balance component and a stability component there as well. So very simply, if you don't use it, you lose it. All right, so principle of diminishing returns. So if you are doing strength and conditioning throughout the year, you finish your academic year, you don't do any work in the, in the gym over the summer and you come back, you're not going to be where you were beforehand. So there is um, an emphasis on maintaining where you are. All right, so you're not always going to be able to push towards raising your ceiling. You're, you can do that, and then you're going to have to back off and stay at kind of a sub-max level and kind of sort of take the mindset of going in, doing good quality work, and punching the clock. Right. Well, we will come back to a lot of these principles in, in the mm -hmm. back half where we sort of talk more about the specific, yeah. specific things that we do that makes use of these underlying fundamentals. Um, if you stop training, right, you will regress to your base level, right? So you're not, your, your strength levels, your power levels will return um, and you will lose that ability uh, that you worked throughout the year to to gain. Uh, this this is a kind of a universal uh, movement law here. So proximal stability for distal athleticism. So what that means is our power generators in the human body are our shoulders and our hips, the ball and socket joints. So whether we're talking about rowing, we're talking about sprinting, we're talking about throwing uh, a fastball and baseball. To be able to do that, we need to have stiffness through the trunk to be able to generate power and velocity at the shoulders and hips. If this isn't able to be well-coordinated and stiff, you're going to have a real hard time generating power at the distal ends of the body. Okay? All right? And stiffness does not mean Frankenstein, like a robot. Rigidity. Yeah. Right? Rigidity. Okay? That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is that ability to sequence and separate out certain joint segments, all right? How many of you coach the Gumby rower? Yeah. They, they apply force to the foot plate, and it just dissipates through, through, through the standing chain on the way to the handle. Or they do squats, and it's just the segments are all over the place. That's a lot, a lot of what we'll do with strength training is working on these skills. That's a motor coordination issue. That's also a strength issue. So the athlete needs to know, how do I organize my segments in order to produce force? And then how do I build that capacity so that I can actually do this reliably in the final 250 of a 2K? Uh, and strength is a skill. Um, so Will and I both take the mindset um, and approach when we're coaching that 
the work that you do in the gym is skill based, just like rowing. So when we go out and we're we're doing drills, working on our technique, that same philosophy applies to the strength and conditioning room. Um, and for us, I think this is probably one of the most important because we're trying to, to help coaches and athletes in the sport of rowing get away from this mindset of doing more or feeling like they need to do a lot of work because the, the training effect, the stimulus you get in that environment is, is way different, you know, than endurance sport. Like the fatigue feeling you have is totally different and it's not necessarily a bad thing to walk out of the gym, not being tired. Unfortunately, people are like, well, I don't feel like I got any work in. You, you did. All right. It's, it's particularly a rower problem because the bar is set so high for rower effort right. that then they, they get used to that being what a workout feels like. Exactly. And there's not this idea of like, we want rowers walking out of strength training sessions most times feeling like I could have done a little more because that leaves room for the next session. And what we're lifting two, sometimes three times a week, year round, stacking up those successive, uh, successful workouts week after week, month after month, block after block, year after year, that's how seniors can row across the finish line a lot faster than when they were freshmen by, by the cumulative work effort. Yeah, it's, com- it's compound interest. And then just one other thing to kind of for the skill aspect of this is um, you have to keep in mind um, as you're working with athletes, say that they're juniors and seniors in high school or college athletes, right, and they are starting to use more external loads. So whether it's barbell, dumbbell, kettlebell, what have you, you have to keep in mind that um, we always want to make technique the emphasis, right? So there's nothing good that's going to happen when an athlete goes into a state of fatigue in a higher rep range, all right? So if they start to lose spine position under load, we know that that's a high injury risk marker, right? So the risk reward there, it's just not worth it. It's, it's not worth it. So... Keeping that in mind and respecting the idea that strength is a skill means if I know as an athlete that, yeah, I could do five reps, I got five reps in the bank, but by that fifth rep, like my form starting to break down, I'm just going to do three. I'm going to make it perfect technique, and then I can just do more sets and still get in the same total volume. So instead of doing maybe, you know, three by five, I do five by three. It's still 15 reps, but they're 15 quality reps, Right. So I, I rode as a junior and then went to college and thought that I was just going to be done with it, played lacrosse, started competing in strength sports, uh, was having a good time with that. I did an internship with the track and field team. I was sort of like the team meathead for the lacrosse team because I always loved lifting, so I would teach the other guys how to lift. I was in the gym a ton. I was a kinesiology major, so I just that was where I gravitated to. Uh, and I knew a lot of the rowers on the team. And so I started to just sort of give them, they, they, they would come to me for advice on stuff. I'd help with a squat technique, deadlift technique, just really basic stuff. And then they said, hey, this is really great. Like, would you want to come out with the rest of the team and, and at least do a ride along with the head coach sometime? And I did. And I would just listen to what he said as he was, as he was coaching the rowers and the problems that he encountered again and again. And we started having these conversations of, of what else could be going on. So what are the technical problems that he's treating as technical problems and what might actually be a structural or a muscular problem that coming from the idea that no rower goes out of the water and thinks, I'm just going to screw this up today. I'm going to go, I'm just going to round my shoulders. I'm going to round my back. I'm going to shoot my slide. I'm just going to piss coach off. You know, uh, no, nobody's intentionally making errors. So if they're, if they're unable to make the correction, then I think we've got to be looking at, at both the coaching side and the communication side, the drills, the skill work. You can go to plenty of other presentations where they're talking about how to have that make more sense to athletes. But we've also got to address, does the athlete have the underlying movement prerequisites to even be able to achieve that in isolation, let alone achieve that in a high force, high fatigue, high effort uh, state. Rowing is chaotic. It seems nice and controlled, but when you're going 38 strokes a minute, in, in, in the final sprint, it's, it's chaos. It's a, it's a high force, high speed movement. And we have to have athletes that could physically achieve that so that they can then work backwards and maintain as much of that as possible under that high fatigue state. So what we're going to do here is just address a few of those common mo- movement errors. Uh, here I've got recovery errors and, and we'll talk about our physical corrections for this too. For, for those of you who are in low back pain and rib stress injury, you heard a little bit of this already. This is sort of my classic low back pain and, and rib stress injury stroke. Uh, how many of you have seen something like this? 
Yep. Um, they've actually found with, with novice and experienced rowers alike that both will sacrifice technique to achieve a given split under fatigue. That's just a rower thing, is if you put that split in front of my face and tell me to hold this, I'm going to do everything that I can to, to do so. That's part of what makes rowers successful. Our job is, as strength conditioning professionals is to try to build that up so that they can delay that point where their movement starts to break down. So that's, again, why we use different techniques than we do for rowing, is if we just put them in the same mindset and say we're going to do six minutes of burpees or whatever, they're just going to be back in that same mindset of doing whatever they need to do in order to sustain force output. And we have an opportunity to strength training to do something different. Uh, so the, the problems here, I mean, I've shot this as though it's the recovery, but since the rowing stroke is cyclical, we know that what happens here is going to affect what happens here, and it's just going to play out again and again. So uh, we've got the, the seat on, on the back of the seat. Um, I'm sitting posteriorly shifted here. Lumbar spine is slumped out. Uh, I've got the round going on here. A lot of forces in, in, in the bow where we do not want them. Uh, then I've got the shoulders rounded forward. So this is this protracted position of, of the shoulders, then that just magnifies um, as the athlete comes out of the recovery, shoving the shoulders forward more. Now my blade height's really unstable. So this is one of the things that the head coach was talking about. He was always talking about blade height, blade height, blade height, but the athletes were all like this. They're not in a position to be able to control the blade. We've got to get them into the shoulders back and down position. That means not only having the movement control to know, hey, here's, here's the ways my, my shoulder blade moves and, and here's how I can support them. But also, I can do this for seven minutes, and, and, and I know I have the muscular endurance to be able to hold that position. So we've got the shoulders up and rounded. That, that Now we're achieving length through the shoulders and the spine. As we approach the catch, it just gets worse. Uh, one of the things that drives us crazy, and we might, if we have extra time, we might just do things we hate for, <laughs> for maybe 10 minutes. Um, the, the, the rower who gets up to the catch, it sort of rebounds. They get that extra reach right at the end. It never does them any good. If they don't sky, like let, let's just say that, that what usually doesn't happen happens and they do get the blade in the water. Now they're in this terribly protracted, unstable position and they go to put force down with the legs and it can't get through the kinetic chain to the shoulder. So I, I talk a lot about power leaks when I'm trying to help this make sense to rowers because if we've got an instability, a weakness somewhere in our kinetic chain, we're going to be losing stroke force. So we're, we're losing performance and from the low back and rib stress idea, we're adding excess stress and strain onto those scalable structures that are so commonly damaged in rowing anyway. So we come out of the catch, we've, we've overly protracted, now we're here, now we're fighting because the other athletes have all applied pressure nicely with their lower bodies, they've got good early drive force, now I'm trying to catch up, the boat's heavier at the end, I'm getting extra force at the back end, um, and so the recovery errors really magnify through the whole stroke cycle and it just gets worse and worse under fatigue. So a couple of the key physical corrections are learning how to do the hip hinge movement that Joe talked about. The basic idea of lumbo-pelvic coordination, lumbo, lumbar spine, pelvic, the pelvis, uh, and being able to use those together in flexion and extension instead of the lumbar spine in isolation. And so they were actually getting productive pelvic tilt. Uh, who's heard of the term anterior pelvic tilt? Okay. Uh, the, the pelvis can tilt anteriorly or posteriorly. Anterior pelvic tilt has gotten sort of a bad name because it's so often correlated with high hip flexor tightness. And when you're talking about the general population, um, it could be a big low back pain problem because people are always sort of in this overextended position. But rowers need to be able to get into anterior pelvic tilt so that they can achieve reach through the hips, not through the spine and the shoulders. So this is a rower who's stuck in posterior pelvic tilt and never gets into anterior pelvic tilt. Ideally, we want to be pretty neutral, but it's got to come from that pelvic rock, not just from the spine and the shoulders. So the hip hinge is the basis of the deadlift, the Romanian deadlift, the power clean, whatever all those exercises you use are. We need to teach rowers how to move the hips back and the lumbar spine forward. So you're welcome, by the way, to stand up and try any of this out as we go. I've got a bunch of different ways that I like to teach this. One way is just the visualization of it was ornamental birds with the, with the bulb on one end and the, and the beak going the other way. That's sort of what we want to be able to create. And I, I don't know what they're called. Does anybody know what the name is? The drinky bird. bird. Yeah, the drinky bird. bird. Everybody knows what they are seemingly, despite, despite I'm not really aware of what their purpose is. Uh, but here we'll, we'll also we'll stand away from a wall 
or, or from a power rack, and we'll just work on pushing the hips back to the wall. Because what often happens with rowers is they just they squat because their, their hips don't move, right? And then their butt's never going to get back to the wall. Or they just bend forward because they don't have the pelvic side of it. And then again, their butt's never going to get back to whatever their target is. So this is, again, like a movement literacy thing. Um, when I work with juniors, a lot of times what I'll frame this as is advanced PE. So if they did PE early on, great. They did jump rope. They did skipping. They did basic games. They learned how to move their body through space. Did they learn how to create force? Usually no. And so we've got to do some of this work to teach athletes how to organize their segments in order to be able to produce force. I don't think that we can assume that they're learning how to do that on water when they're also worrying about blade and crew fit and, you know, ma matching up a stroke and, oh, I just hit the water on that one. Like there's too much going on. So we've got to have these different roles of the rowing training and the strength training. Uh, the other movement that I'll use, we, we covered the hip hinge and the lumbo-pelvic coordination is the scapular coordination. I know we come down to those ball and socket joints like Joe talked about. Uh, the one that I'll use for the scapular coordination, the shoulder joint is a four-way joint. So it does protraction and retraction, and it does external rotation and internal rotation. And usually we don't explore the corners of those different movements. So one that I like for that is called the YWT raise. We just like the song, we make the letters, but they're Y, W, and T instead. Um, and again, if you want, stand up, find, find space, feel this out. When, when I introduce this, I'll, I'll do, uh, for the folks who attend the weekend sessions at the Crashbury Rowing Center, we'll do like a weekend strength conditioning clinic. And I'll roll this one out. And from juniors to masters, this is usually a new movement and a new feeling in the shoulders for everybody. What we're working on here is getting the shoulder blades back and down. So go shoulders in the back pockets is, is my other cue for that. From the hip hinge position. So again, we're working on that still too. We're going to keep the thumbs up into external rotation instead of internal rotation. From the hip hinge, shoulders back and down, arms straight, just raising and trying to feel those fine muscles in between the shoulder blade working. And so we'll do this as the Y raise. We'll then go into the W raise. Again, just trying to pinch between the shoulder blades, shoulders back and down. And then we'll go into the T raise as the last one for more of the posterior shoulder complex. So this is where doing the movement education side, actually learning how to manipulate the shoulder joint in those different directions. And then we're also training those because if we do three sets of 10, we'll do 10 Ys, 10 Ws, 10 Ts, or we'll do them in a different order. Uh, to change it up. But by, by, by the third set, those little muscles are screaming. And, and those are what keeps you anchored in that shoulders back and down position. So you can get to the catch from that stable position. I know some coaches like more protraction, some like more retraction. That's fine. <coughs> what pretty much everybody agrees on is that the shoulders should be down. That we don't want athletes at the catch with their elbows or with their, with their shoulders up around their ears. Um, and so I'm fine on all this individual stroke style stuff. But the basic idea is that we need to be in a sound position to develop force from the foot plate and have it go through the body into the handle. So those are two of the ones that I use most um, for the recovery errors, which again, then become entry and drive errors to just teach those skills. And then also we'll build on those uh, with, with more exercises for those specific muscles once the rower has the ability to. But the nice thing about those is that everybody can do them regardless of where you are. So if you're in a boathouse and you have extra time, you can do the hip hinge. You can find ways to load it lightly with uh, resistance bands or, or lighter weights if you have access to them. YWT raise, uh, when I was coaching the, the Western men's college team, the strongest athletes would use like five, maybe 10 pound plates. Most everybody would be doing the body weight. Again, we're, we're doing reps here. They're fine muscles. We're just trying to get into that deep shoulder blade area. Uh, two and a half pound plates are nice or, or, or lightly loaded dumbbells or the, the very thinnest of resistance bands you could use as well. Uh, but that's something you could do that's not that stress, uh, burpee, maximal sort of zone, but it's still a very productive use of time. All right, that's Joe. Um, the only thing I'd add uh, on top of what Will said, um, so YTWs are great, uh, L as well. Um, so doing kind of a 90-90 external rotation. Um, I would recommend uh, with if you're working with juniors or college athletes, just start off body weight. If you have a Swiss ball or a stability ball, get them in a prone position where they're laying on the ball and doing it. Same thing, just like you talked about, thumb up. All right. I've seen it seated on a ball too, or, or seated with the ball. In so front it's going to be more. It's, it'll definitely be more it. challenging from a prone position against gravity. So they're going to get a lot more muscle recruitment, yeah. and you take the lower body out of the equation, so they don't they don't get confused. Mm -hmm. 
right? It could, so, it could be productive if the athlete has the ability to hip hinge to build up some time yeah. maintaining that, but yeah. sometimes, yeah, it's too much. Yeah, so breaking them down into a position where you're just focusing on that segment, and they should they should feel that mid to low trap, so right here in that mid to low back area. All right. Yeah, so I've done them laying down, like yep. forehead on the ground. Yep. Do you recommend the standing? Does like that encourage you could do them. Yeah, you can do them. I mean, so I don't like putting my face on the ground and <laughs> so I, and I do that sort of the number towel. one, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, you'll, you'll see sometimes the, um, coaches will have like a massage table or a table and mm-hmm. they'll have the athlete hanging off the edge of the table and do one arm uh, at a time. Or more um, like a rehab setting. It, it, yeah. If I've got 30 or 40 runners at a time, like, I mean, one, the sort of the number one rule of coaching is don't ask people to do something you wouldn't do. I wouldn't put my face on the ground. Uh, and, then, and then for another, like, we can get everybody standing up and doing it all That's why, that if you're going to do the prone position, you're kind of on the Swiss ball because you get a little yeah. bit more space. And a little more range of motion, too. It's, it's less, less of an isometric. It's a fine motor control exercise. So um, getting to the point where you're doing light loads is excellent. That's definitely something to strive for. Um, but, you know, working in a rehabilitation setting get everybody to do it really well just unloaded first. Totally. Quality or quantity yeah. situation. Yeah. Because yeah. if, if they're, if, if as the athlete's getting more fatigued, they're getting back into this shoulders yep. up thing, then, then we're just training the same muscles that we're, that we're trying to get out of. So the, the, the traps or the trapezius muscles is a three headed muscle. Upper traps is what the power group is. It's what we use a lot when we're trying to develop power growing, but it's the lower and the middle traps that we're targeting with that exercise. That is what keeps the shoulder blade anchored. Okay, so on this one, um, I'm trying to kind of execute that classic, you know, nice bend through the mid thoracic junction. Um, so that's what we're looking at here on the erg is kind of slumping down, reaching forward through the mid back, that classic rower's posture we see at the catch. All right. Um, What we want to do is be a little bit more upright, try to keep a a neutral spine, tall chest. And so this is one where you might, you might coach this, oh, the athlete's shooting their slide. And, and maybe that's a technical issue. Maybe Mm -hmm. the athlete doesn't understand connection. Maybe we can address that from a drill based perspective. Once you've tried that a couple times, maybe it's better to go into some of these physical corrections. Yep. Uh, And so this is just another, another shot of an athlete shooting the slide. Right there, All right. So some of the movement errors. Um, so that kind of ties into when we have the opportunity to m- remove the athlete from you know the rowing shell where they're in an environment where they're getting a lot of stimulus. There's a lot of noise. It's a very disruptive signal. It's hard to you know be able to separate out how they are moving as an individual when they've got potentially seven other people around them, wind, rain wake, launch, you know, all that type of thing. Coach barking at them. Right. So then you get into a strength and conditioning environment and you can break them down where they can get into positions where they can feel a lot more. So, you know, working the hip hinge, right? If they, if you have athletes that have trouble with that, don't be afraid to just break them down to tall kneeling and go here and now they're hip hinging, right? So take their feet out of the equation, break it down, make it even simpler for them. If you want to work on um, separating out some of the, the, the joint segments, as Will and I have both kind of talked about this morning, you, know, you can get them into a quadruped position and work on just doing pelvic tilts. So just simple cues of, you know, arch your back, flatten your back. All right. So just trying to move the pelvis. Then think about doing that at the T-spine. So, you know, lift the chest, create a dome, push the chest down to the floor. Right. Is the athlete able to separate out each joint segment? Okay. And then do that with the cervical spine. Okay. And then, you know, then you can take that and build into your cat cow exercise where you're moving all three segments of the spine together. Right. And then but, do the unilateral one with the bird dog. Right. And then do the unilateral one with the bird dog. But so what you're looking at is that's a that's a really good opportunity. Okay to start teaching the athlete how to separate out each part of their body, right? So that is going to help you on the rowing side with all that fine motor skill, that coordination part, all right? I want to add one thing, too, to the drive errors. Uh, We talked about mobility and and basic skills. This could just be a strength error, too. What's going to happen if the athlete gets 
up to the couch, gets the blade in the water, and then they're weak in the legs. They're just going to get to the point where they can develop force, and then they're going to develop force from there, as much as they can keep up with everybody else. So if, if the legs aren't strong, it doesn't matter how much we're going to coach them early drive, early drive, early drive, entry drills, all that stuff, because they're, they're just not going to be able to generate enough force to, to keep up with their, with their teammates or with the speed of the boat. That could be, yeah, just simple strength. I have another question on the catch. Yeah. So what do you do with the athlete who goes up to the catch and the knees uh, fly, up, fly apart? Yeah, that's that's a that's a common error for sure. Yeah, so I would I would definitely be a little bit more curious as to that athlete's hip anatomy, um, because if they're splaying out, right? Like to me, that that their nervous system, their body's trying to find room to get comfortable in that catch position. Um, so you have to keep in mind, like in rowing, we're we're bolted down with a foot stretcher, so. When you're getting up there, your body's going to find a way, right? If we're, if we're a good athlete, you tell me to do something, I'm going to move a bar. I'm going to figure out a way to get it off the floor. It may not be good. It may not be like, you know, good movement literacy. So I would, I would be kind of curious as to how much room they have in, in their hip to be able to get into that position. So I would be looking at that. I'd also be looking at where is their pelvis and low back position at the catch? Like, are they tucked under? You know, are they kind of sitting on their tailbone and like they can't be in a position where they have their hips underneath them and are they rocking over? Like, I don't know. Um, yeah, know, so it's sort of looking at the stroke as a cycle. So we've got to look at how the athlete's getting there as well as what's actually happening when they are there. So is it something you don't always need to train away, try to train away? Maybe it's a natural thing. Um, well, we need we need to train away if it's if it's causing problems with with the athletes rowing. So to some extent, yeah, we've got our foot stretchers bolted in as we are. Uh, we're we're stuck with that. We need to make the best of that situation. Uh, but with Joe's the the principle of individuality, maybe there's always going to be a little bit of knee play there. But what can we do in training uh, to to get that to be as little as possible? Mm -hmm. um, and and also making sure is the athlete like is that movement error happening in isolation? Or is there something else happening that's causing that? So if the athlete's coming out of the out of the recovery with the posterior pelvic tilt, they're not going to be able to get into a solid position. So let's clear up that first, see how they do as they approach the catch. So would you like use a squat rack to try to get them to... Yeah, did you see Joe's, the, the hip yeah. scour that he de demonstrated first? That That's a good way to do yeah. it. Um, you can also use a rack and sort of hang off of it and then squat down to see if the athlete's able to maintain... A, a neutral pelvic position as they go. Um, yeah, we can, we can approach that from a variety of ways. And importantly, Joe and I are strength coaches. So mostly what we do is take healthy athletes and make them fitter, stronger, and then turn them over to the rowing, the, the rowing coach so they can make them faster and, and better at rowing. There's another gap there for a physical therapist, which is when someone doesn't move in quite the right way or when they have an injury, we refer that out. Uh, that's, that's just sort of part of, ha of having an effective staff is ideally having a, a physical therapist you can at least get access to if they're not on your staff um, and, and trying to work with them on the rowing side of things for, hey, here's what the athlete needs to be able to do. Yeah, a couple, couple other suggestions for you. I would, um, I would look like when they're squatting and watching their alignment from ankle, knee, hip. Um, are, they, are they tracking the second, third toe of the foot? Are they valgus, like collapsing in? Are they going bearish or are they going out towards their pinky toe? Um, because if, if they're doing that when they squat and then you're saying when they get out to the catch, they're, you know, that might just be a little bit of, wow, I'm not even, I don't have awareness of that. Is it strength? I, is it motor right. pattern? Is, is it, it a mobility? motor pattern? Yeah. Right. So if they're squatting down, you know, second, third toe, valgus, I'm like this or bearish, I'm going to shove it out towards like, like a bulldog, like towards the pinky toe, you know, what kind of stress is that placing on the knee, all right? So I would be curious to see how they're moving in other environments. And if you start to see that same pattern again, that would kind of lead me to believe it's, okay, let's bring some awareness to that athlete. Let's work on the patterning aspect um, or even see them dynamically. So how do they land at the bottom of a jump, like a plyometric? Um, are they landing in that kind of splayed out position, all right? 
And so this is again the advantage of being able to approach tank training from a from a multifaceted perspective instead of just let's find what they do in rowing and make them do that harder in a different way. We can introduce these different skills as the coach. This means we get to see the athlete move in different ways, can sort of put this together for the whole athletic picture. And then for the rower, they're learning how to do different skills in a, in a different way than they are when they're just rowing. Um, what we want to present is just sort of like the hierarchy of uh, these are the categories of basic movement, and this is roughly the difficulty from from simplest to most difficult. Uh, as here here are the things that you might be able to do, given given your coaching context, your equipment situation, the athletes that you coach. We would typically start, whether they're junior masters or college rowers, at the simplest thing. So. Can they do a bodyweight squat with, with the basic fundamentals like Joe was talking about? Can they do the hip hinge pattern and, and move the lumbar spine of the pelvis in a, in a coordinated way? Uh, we use a ton of uh, resistance bands and stuff because that's, they're, they're portable, they're cheap, they're, they're customizable. If you want to make it harder, you move away from it more. If you want to make it easier, you move towards it more. They sell them in different weights. Um, and you can get them and they'll last for, for forever. You can just throw them around and, and leave, leave them in the boathouse all hung up in one place. They don't take up as much room as squat racks or kettlebells or stuff like that. So we make a ton of use of that. The, the X-band row, is a, it comes off of the rack, makes an X, and then the athlete pulls it into the same, basically their same release position. There we're looking at tying in the physical skills of what we hope they do with the release to developing the musculature um, and, and have another opportunity to sort of reinforce that, that same motor pattern. Uh, push up variations are one that, that we've got variations, not just straight up push up. Um, I, I coached at one of the Olympic development programs over the summer and had a, uh, she was maybe a sophomore girl, um, in, in one of my strength training workshops. And I asked the, the, the groups as we were going what, what they really wanted to learn that day. If they had one sort of specific goal, she said, I want to learn how to do a push up." Because my coach always tells me that, that my push-up form sucks. I was like, okay, cool. So we, we looked at her do it, and she, you know, she's 15 years old, maybe 120 pounds, uh, and 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 she she goes down and just her arms are wobbling, and, and she can't can't even get all the way down, and then sort of comes back up and sort of anything goes. You know, it was it was a one rep max push-up. It was way too hard for her. So I raised her up onto blocks, maybe like a 24-inch plyo box or something like that. And I said, okay, now do a push-up. And she did it perfectly. Shoulders back and down, full range of motion, elbows staying tucked in. It was just too challenging of a variation for her. I find, especially with push-ups, people will do levels of intensity that they would never do with the bar or with a dumbbell because, oh, it's just body weight. But if it's too high a percentage of your max, then you're not going to be able to express the technique correctly. So we'd always start with a scaled-down version, make sure the athlete can do that successfully, then you're looking at, okay, is it a technique? Is it a strength thing? They could build up strength in that elevated push-up environment. And I'll use this with, with college men rowers too, particularly the long and lengthy type. Um, and the same, same thing we don't have uh, with the chin-ups down later on. That could be the same problem. The ro rowers tend to be long-limbed, long ranges of motion. These body weight lifts, and I've got the barbell deadlift all the way down at the bottom for the same reason. I have a six foot five rower. They're going a lot further down than, than a five foot eight person. Uh, and they're, they're doing more range of motion, the bar is lower because we arbitrarily set this height down that's going off on a slight tangent. But does anybody know why the deadlift starting height is where it is? About nine and a half inches off the ground? So if the weight drops, you don't actually get crushed by it if you come down on... It's from, it's from Olympic lifting in, in the late 1800s to early 1900s. Nine and a half inches was deemed to be the average width of the of the male adult skull so that if they dropped the barbell from overhead it would not crush the skull of the lifter that's the only reason that a deadlift is nine and a half inches off the ground there's no reason for us to be doing that for rowers based on this 140 year old history of when men's skulls were were nine and a half inches or less and and therefore we needed to avoid crushing them so we use an elevated deadlift uh, we'll use a kettlebell swing we'll use a, he uh, a hex bar or a trap bar deadlift that's where the athlete stands in the frame we need high handles, low handles, raise the height. There's no point for purity in, in a rowing training program. Let's find the exercises and the, and the movements that best suit the rower. Principle of individuality, principle of specificity. Are we still training what we want to be training? Yes. Then we can use any of these lifts to achieve that same goal in different ways, 
and in different times of the year. So that's one of the things we'll talk about next. Uh, a, a full body land warm up is a, is a great place to start with, with basic strength training. Uh, how many have some sort of general land based warm up that they do before you get out in the water? Okay, and then how many people just go straight into rowing or? or yeah. All right, cool. Um, a, a lot of times I find that there, there are people who just, you get to the boathouse, your warm up is taking your oars down to the water, and take your boat down to the water, and then you get out there and warm up on, on, on the water. Uh, you know, that, that might be fine for some, for, for some times of the year, for some things, for some sessions. Okay, you just got to do what you got to do. Most times, a, a 10 to 15 minute full body dynamic warm up uh, that addresses the whole kinetic chain from ankles to shoulders can accelerate your sessions by making athletes be more able to get into full speed, full side rowing when they get out the water. And it's also an opportunity to teach these different skills without it seeming so, okay, we have to go on land to do coaches movement literacy circuit. We can sneak this into training. Uh, and so I'll work a lot of this. We'll do the hip hinge, we'll do the YWT raise, we'll do the push up exercise with a plus reach and round movement. So they get up to the top and then they get into that thoracic flexion like Joe demonstrated here on the floor. That's building up the serratus anterior muscle. We talked about the rib stress injury prevention plan. Uh, and it's also getting the athlete to move through those different ranges of motion and explore that shoulder mobility. So we can sneak a lot of that in to, to the full body land warm up. You know, if, if you're just doing leg swings and jumping jacks, we can innovate a little bit more than that to start to work in some of these other fundamentals. Rowing has a long history um, use of, of circuit training, uh, kind of the classic coffee can barbell in the boathouse. <laughs> From what I could find, it, it's kind of originated out of the 1970s at the GDR. Um, you know, they, they were one of the first proponents of creating stations or circuit style training using lighter loads and higher repetitions. Um, so if you, if you don't have access to equipment uh, uh, and you're doing circuit style based training at the boathouse or, you know, in a hallway, right? It's very makeshift. Um, you don't have access to a lot of space. The, the, the things that I would emphasize and principles I would go by for, for your athletes are um, stick to the basics, the fundamentals. Okay. So make sure they're, they're checking the boxes. So I would organize a session. If you have a group of say, you know, 25 athletes or 30 athletes, get them in, um, you know, a military style setup where they're in, you know, six rows of five. All right. Have the first row step forward. You're doing, you know, body weight squats or whatever and watch the technique. All right. Be very diligent about how they're performing the exercises and move through. So just have them go to the back of the line, move through. Everybody does that. And then the next time up, they're doing a different exercise. So there might be a little bit more downtime in there, but if you're working with that, that, the, the athletes that don't have those fundamentals checked, you, you have to take the time to make sure they're doing the basics well. Like they need to be able to check the box of doing a body weight squat, doing a chin up, doing a pull up. Um, to me, that's really, really important to be able to demonstrate to a coach from an athletic point of view, I'm able to maintain spine position as I move through space. This again comes down to why, why are you doing the strength training? Are you doing it just to try to make them work hard, feel like rowing, uh, right. babysit? You know, there's, there's, all, there's all these reasons that we sort of end up in these circus style training. We have the opportunity to flip the script and do something different and, and use it to teach movements, to develop basics, and, and to start to teach force generation. Yeah, and, and uh, another thought I've had is if, if you have a large group and, you know, you don't have a lot of time, don't feel like you need to have like, you know, Andy Reed's menu that like where you're, you know, picking like 25 different exercises. Just again, stick with the basics, get them very proficient and make them um, work hard by just manipulating different variables of the lift. So for example, if you get them into a like lunge type or split squat type pattern, have them go really slow on the eccentric portion, right? So you keep the reps low, like five reps, but they got to control, go from the top down to the bottom in five seconds. And you're going to count out loud for every repetition. So they're going to go down really slowly all the way, gently tap and explode up. Do that for every repetition. So you're building a lot of control through the hip, through the knee, through the quadriceps, through the whole kinetic chain. Um, 
that's going to transfer over really well. So when you're looking at those athletes that they're coming up the slide and they just kind of like, it's like a car crash. They're just coming up and they have no control. That's, that's eccentric control of, of the, of the muscles. So they need to be able to decelerate force. That's why we're working on that eccentric portion of the lift. All right. So just because they're not doing high repetitions or a lot of different exercises doesn't mean it's hard work. I've got a, a, a class of junior uh, soccer athletes. We have them do three sets of five with a 10 to 15 pound kettlebell or dumbbell doing exactly what I just demonstrated. And on the last set, they hold at the bottom position after they just did 15 reps of five second eccentric. The last, very last set, they do a 10 second isometric at the bottom. And to, to an athlete, they are shaking. They are shaking. And try this yourself before you roll it out. Too. Yeah. Very, and I do it, yeah. I do it with them and yeah. I'm working hard too. You know, I'm working hard too. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can spice it up, um, and have your athletes work very hard if you have very minimalistic resources at your disposal. And like part of that benefit too, is that then we're getting, we're getting more benefit from lighter loads and lower reps. So we're cutting down on, on, on the overuse that you heard me talk about. If you came to low back pain and, and rib stress injuries, strength training is a part of the rowing training, total volume picture. If we're doing a lot of rowing volume and also we're doing 25 plus rep uh, muscular endurance circuits, then we're just contributing to it to a lot of those same stroke muscle overuse problems that, 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 that we can see. So not only are we getting more out of it, we're also mitigating a potential over risk use. And based on our experience, athletes are much more able to transfer that style of physical learning mm -hmm. back to uh, rowing on water uh, or, or on the erg than they are from doing more reps under high fatigue conditions. One thing that we'll do with circuit training as well is build in mobility opportunities. So we might do uh, two to three sets of, e of either a squat or a hinge or, or a shoulder thing, and then we'll have them go into a, a mobility movement as well. So you can mix all these different modes of training uh, in, in, a, in a much more productive way than, than what we see is just sort of the same, the same repetitive hammering. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about, about periodization. Uh, periodization just means organizing training. So it's having some sort of system or structure for your training so that athletes develop major athletic qualities while maintaining other major athletic qualities. There's a tons of different ways to achieve periodization, lots of different strategies. Uh, at its core, it's having a plan for your off-season, a plan for your preseason, and a plan for your in-season. So this gets into uh, the huge benefit of off-season training is when we've got a reduced rowing workload, we can have an increased strength training workload. So we're always sort of working this yin and yang to avoid overloading rowers at certain times and avoid underloading rowers at certain times. And they, you asked me this question in low back pain yesterday. I had a chart that showed workload correlated to low back pain low off-season volume, also low back, low and low incidence of low back pain, and then really high in-season volume and a much higher incidence of low back pain. So Nate asked the question of, well, to what extent is this just rowers not working hard enough in the off-season and not preparing themselves for this bet, for, for coming back to in-season rowing? And yeah, it's both. It's, it's we need to have enough work in the off-season so that coming back to the volume that we need to do for rowing in season is not shocking. We also need to take a more progressive approach to returning to in season rowing. Bit of a sidebar, but the off season time is a really, really crucial time to make use of the reduced rowing training for increased strength training time. Uh, it's it's more engaging for rowers too, having this this different sort of ebb and flow over the season uh, that that they're developing different qualities at different times. Less burnout, less sort of just oh man, we do the same the same program, the same training year round. Uh, I know that a challenge is what are your rowers doing in the off season, especially if you're with a junior crew, maybe they're playing other sports, you don't have control over that. Um, and so I'd, I'd definitely like to talk more in this, in this second session about what problems you're actually encountering and, and what we might be able to do um, as strength coaches to provide those resources. But, but at its core, in the off season, there's reduced rowing training, higher volume strength training. In the preseason, we start to cut down the strength training start to make it more about developing peak power. We've built muscle, we've built endurance, we've built base strength over the off season while the athletes built fitness. As we get closer to in season, it all sort of narrows down so that eventually we get to peak performance 
uh, in whatever your peak performance season is. Uh, usually if you're on the junior collegiate schedule, we're sort of starting in the summer off season and progressing up to the May uh, championship race. And the idea is that the exercise selection gets a little bit more narrow, the volume comes down, the intensity goes up. And then eventually, like Joe said, we just try to hold on to what we've got. Some athletes do make positive changes through, through the in-season. Most times what we're trying to do is just hold on to those off-season benefits and make sure that the athlete gets to the podium uh, as strong, healthy, fit, and mobile as when they started training. That's one of the things that drives us crazy is when rowers have an off-season approach and then racing season starts and it's like, I'm out of here, see you in the summer. Like, no, like then you, you, you're strongest at the start of the season when it matters the least and you're the weakest at the end of the season when it matters the most. And so it's not that hard to do a system of strength training. You can maintain a lot easier than you can gain. Um, and so having an in-season approach to reduce volume, reduce challenge, but maintaining what you have so that you're still getting to the championship time um, in, in good shape. Anyway. So that's, that's it for our presentation. Here's where you can see more of us. Joe's presenting in session five on the evolution of strength conditioning training for rowing. Um, I'm presenting in session six on low back pain and rib stress injuries. We both have a podcast where you can hear, I think we're up to, what, 13 episodes? Yeah, I think or so. 13 or 14 episodes. Yeah. Just talk, talk about different training topics and rowing. Sometimes we'll have a theme for an episode. Sometimes we'll just address a bunch of different stuff. Uh, we've got websites. I've also written a book that I have copies of for addressing the periodization picture of year-round rowing. Joe contributed a chapter to that on how to uh, implement kettlebells into your training. Um, so that's a lot more about those specific lifts, but we're pretty much right on an hour now, so we'd like Great. to turn this over to uh, your questions, ideas, situations, do a bit of collaborative brainstorming. Yeah? Um, when you talk about variation of push-ups, is it better, or do you, is there a difference between modifying by dropping to the knees or modifying by raising the arm, elevating? I prefer the elevated. Uh, because I think it's more similar to what the athlete is hopefully eventually ultimately going to be able to do. Um, I also find that the, that the common thing that happens when the athlete goes to the knees instead of going elevated is different segments will move at different speeds. So ideally on a push-up, the chin, chest, and hips all basically touch simultaneously. So they, they, they all hit the ground simultaneously, they all rise simultaneously. When the athlete's on the knees, I mean, the chest tends to move faster. Um, and I'd rather see the whole the whole system moving at once. I, I think it's a little bit easier. Like if you go to the knees, there's no real progression beyond that. But with the elevation, we could start at 24 inches and and work all the way down yeah. to you know four inches, and then you might as well be going yeah. off the ground. No, 100% agree. Uh, yeah. That's the exact same approach I take. Um, uh, I think the only thing I would add is just if you're working with athletes, you you might have a group where you have athletes that can do quality push-ups from the floor. And then you might have some that you need to back off to an elevation. Uh, just be patient. It, it, depending on that athlete's training age um, and how often they've done strength training, like I, I've seen it take anywhere from three to six months. And that depends on how frequently they're strength training, again, their, their training history. Um, are they working on it outside? You know, are they coming to you one day a week or two days a week? How, how often are they working on it? Um, you know, those are going to play a lot of factors into them getting to the floor eventually. But just have the courage and the discipline to back off and be patient uh, because you're going to go a lot further, you know, backing off to an elevation, going through a full range of motion than, than from your knees. There's also no no benefit to rushing it. So I've never no. I've, ne I've never had a crew row across the finish line and no. had a ref sidle over to him and go, oh excuse me, how many of you could do full range push-ups? Right? Like you get medals of rowing for rowing faster, not for being able to do push-ups. So we, we look at exercise selection as finding the best tool for the athlete, not our arbitrary standards of physical fitness. I was a little curious on your um, I had I've had coaches that emphasize balance and kind of heavy equal strength across joints. I had, you know, maybe it was a little more old school, but I had one coach that was sort of like, don't develop anything you don't need to row. Yeah. So like, we'd like get in trouble for doing a bench press. Uh, like we yeah. get, you know, so uh, any, any quick thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, and some long thoughts too, but yeah. uh, <laughs> muscular balance is important because if, if we only develop the rowing stroke muscles, then we're, we're going to be good at that, but, but at nothing else. So, 
if we've got a if we've got multi-sport athletes, people who want to be able to do things beyond rowing, then it's really nice to have a fully functioning body. Uh, there's also various overuse problems that can happen from overdevelopment of certain muscles, which is really the same thing as saying underdevelopment of other muscles. So have you seen the rower walking around just like this at the regattas, where they're just overextended, shoulders back, pinned all the time? Like that's an athlete who hasn't developed these muscles. So that all the 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 research is a bit mixed on like how exactly the overuse turns into the injury risk, but uh, I certainly don't buy that that's going to hold you back from rowing. Um, and then body weight is productive, or muscle weight is productive for rowing. So if you have more muscle weight, you can exert more leverage on the blade. And if we're only limiting our muscular development of the stroke muscles, then we're missing out on all that muscular gain potential elsewhere. Yeah. Anyone add? No, that, that was great. Um, <laughs> just directly on the bench press, I, I t- typically shy away from doing that with with rowers um because in the rowing stroke we're getting into uh, a position of potential flexion and protraction and in the bench press when you're on on the bench you're pinning the scapula back against the the bench so as you're going through that range of motion the scapula is not moving around the rib cage so you're missing an opportunity for for good scapula humeral rhythm unlike the push-up where it right so as we've been talking about, like during this presentation, if we're doing a, a push up, coming down, coming up, right? But if I do a push up plus, coming up, and then really emphasizing that top part, I want to coach that athlete so that their shoulder blades move around the rib cage. That's what we're looking for, right? So it's that emphasis of yes, they've already fully extended their wrist, elbow, and shoulder, but they're continuing to push through the floor so that gets that last little bit of the shoulder blade moving around the rib cage. We could also make the push-up harder too. We talked about regressions. We could talk about progressions too. Yep. So uh, that's another area where I'll use a resistance band stretched across the athlete's back to the hands and then it just adds extra tension at the top. So we can continue to make the push-up challenging. Yep. Uh, or a weight vest. I, yep. I I wouldn't use a plate because yeah. that's I don't like it's the... Unstable. Yeah, yeah, it's unstable. I don't like the idea of placing a plate on their spine whereas the, the weight vest is going to be more evenly distributed load anterior and posterior. And if the, you smash a finger in this rowing practice because you've dropped a plate on yourself, the rowing coach is yeah. going to be pissed, so <laughs> that doesn't do anybody any, any favors. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, just if you could speak to stretching a little bit. Like if that's, uh, is that part of what you're doing with strength training? Yeah, yeah. Flexibility, mobility, all, all part of the similar picture. Mm-hmm. Um, I think... At least I find that rowers tend to be more force deficient than flexibility deficient. But again, we've got to look at that whole picture of mobility and flexibility is basically can the athlete get into position? Strength is can the athlete develop force from that position? So we can look at it from from both ways. Um, stretching, generally helpful. Uh, we, we, we use it in a bunch of different ways. I think, I think dynamic stretching before... Uh, training is particularly helpful, especially if the, that helps the athlete get into the positions that you want them to be able to get into. Um, and then there is also a stretching effect from moving through full ranges of motion under load. So just yes. doing strength training is also productive for that. That um, I've actually found that, like rowers with sort of chronically tight lo- lower body hamstring muscles in particular, doing reps of the hip hinge is moving them through that with extra load exerting a greater stretch and also a contraction on the way back up. So that's, that's been a way that I've found uh, more effective than doing a lot of say sit and reach, uh, hamstring stretching. So, uh, that was great. Uh, I think the only thing I would add is, um, so at the beginning of a session, do dynamic, dynamic warm up where they're, they're moving through and getting some of that flexibility. If we were doing more of your classic static stretching, like longer 20, 30, 60 second holds, that's, after the training session. So we definitely know from, from research that is not something you want to do before any type of training, t- training, str- uh, training session. That is actually going to decrease your performance. And your force output, yep. basically. That, so that's what's going to happen. That, that we want activation and movement earlier in the session. Mm-hmm. Um, so flexibility work, I usually you know leave that in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the session. Uh, depending on what lifts we're covering on that day, then I would have some prescribed targeted s- stretches um, to to do that. So, if we're doing something that's posterior chain dominant, you know, glute hamstring, maybe they're doing some um, strap stretches, you know, with the hamstring at the end. 
However, complement what, what Will said, what I will find is that as athletes get stronger over time, the amount of time that they're going to need to spend on flexibility work is going to significantly decrease because your base level of strength has gotten higher over time. So your ability to go through a larger range of motion is, is pretty set and stable, right? Um, when you're, when you don't have that strength, that's when you're kind of, it's this tug of war, you're working on getting stronger and then you've got to work a little bit on flexibility. I spend a lot less time working on flexibility for myself now than I ever have before because this is probably some of the strongest I've ever been at this point in my life. And, uh, and I'll say for me too, I've, I've gone toward much more dynamic stretching. Um, mm-hmm. on, on the subject of, of full body warm ups, I, I have my own. Uh, it's like ten minute different movement series that, that I'll use with rowers as a as a video and article on my website. Uh, it's more of a muscular force development. Warm up. I also have a link to a rowing physical therapist's uh, ten minute warm up that he does. His name is Greg Spooner of the Row Physio Program. If anybody's heard of him, he's got a great uh, uh, hip and spine rotational dynamic warm up that he uses, um, which could be especially useful, particularly with junior athletes. It's great for exploring the corners of, of different pelvic movements and, and and different spine rotations. And then it's also great with that athlete who just doesn't have enough reach be able to get into good rowing positions. I find that using dynamic stretching and having the athlete moving through those ranges of motion um, is, is more effective than, than the static stretching that, that I had been doing before. So he's got a lot, a lot of really cool movements in there, half, half kneeling hip chops and stuff for thoracic and, and, and hip flexor mobility, all, all that stuff. I used a lot myself too. It, but. Is there a particular area? I guess I'm thinking of the kind of classic like hunched, maybe closer tilted pelvis athlete that seems to be more um, hip movement. Yeah. If you're not getting that. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, one, one factor in that is that, is that we're the dummies that do a a seated sport. uh, So we're always stuck in this movement. Like a half kneeling hip flexor stretch. Right. So I would probably have an Eric pad or a yoga mat down here. Um, but around 18 inches doing a half kneeling hip flexor. So getting them in neutral from, their ear, shoulder, hip, knee, all right, straight plumb line, squeezing that back glute, and then just thinking about pushing the hips forward one inch, and almost everybody kind of just lights up like a Christmas tree. They'll feel an immediate stretch right through the yeah. yeah, show us the full, the full yeah. 360. He's, he's, and, and explain why you've got your knee bent, too, on that back. Yeah, so you're going to, and you can do this without the chair, but if you do it, this is just going to, like, really intensify the stretch all right so you you could use a plyo box you can use a chair about around 15 to 18 inches it's going to depend on how tall the athlete is this is a good one for uh, lengthening stretching the hip flexors all right so keep in mind probably a lot of your athletes are either high school or college so on top of you know time in the in the boat or on the erg they're sitting in school or masters they're sitting at a desk at work they're sitting at a desk at work so this is a really good one you get a lot of bang for your buck here um to, to open up that anterior part of the hip right there. Um, if you're uh, also tight through uh, the adductors or the groin area, doing uh, the frog series is really good. Are you familiar with that? Okay, so that's a really good one. So that's probably a good example of like a static stretch I would do at the end of a session. If you want to do something like more dynamic, you could take like a very light like mini band. Two. And then... Um, you could just have your athletes get into a position and then they just do Whoa. I broke it. Too strong. <laughs> and uh, do marching. I was bringing endorsement to perform better. Yeah. <laughs> so just do marching in place, right? So they're, now you're working on that dynamic flexibility where they're using their, their hip flexor to come up into that position, right? Um, so that's stuff that you can do in the, in the warm-up, um, you know, at the beginning of the session. In, in regards to the, you know, prolonged eccentric kind of circuit work you were talking about that sure. it allows you to kind of reduce the overall reps, uh, would that be something that you think has a place in potentially during like a, you know, a winter training trip where the team is going to be rowing, you know, 25K plus a day, there's no access to a strength training room, you know, if, would it potentially be beneficial to do something like three by five squats 
you know, three days a week? Uh, I wouldn't do the eccentrics on a training trip like that because you're already going to be rowing yeah. multiple times a day. Um, the eccentrics are very fatiguing. Um, it can from make a, you super sore. Yep. <laughs> so from a neurological standpoint, nervous system standpoint, like, you know, you're, you're going to be, like I said, shaking at the end. Like it, it, it kind of takes you there. Um, and to Will's point, you, you potentially could be quite sore, especially if they haven't done them. They'll be sore for, you know, one to three days. And then so all of a sudden they're going to go like get in the boat. And that now is going to affect how they row. So in that environment, in that situation, I would say no. If, if that's two weeks and you're doing high, higher volume, higher frequency, more specific rowing training, and you, you're strength training year-round sort of otherwise, maybe that's two weeks just to back off on the strength training, focus on the rowing training side. That's sort of we can get into those micro, micro periodization pictures. Yeah, so um, I, I'm getting ready to head into a camp situation. So tomorrow I'll, I'll head down to Boston and fly over to, to Portugal to work with the team. So they're going to be on the water twice a day, and we're going to be in the gym once a day. So everything I do is like very micro dose. So, you know, their volume standpoint during this week is already going to be up, right? Um, so what I do in the gym is the the repetitions that we do are going to be very low. I'm going to be working a lot on technique. I might do some assessment or, or testing to kind of see where they are, um, but also from a, from a skill standpoint. So they might do a lot of reps over a, you know, 45 to 75 minute time period, but I'm not going to have them be doing like five rep sets. It might be like two or three rest, two or three, that type of thing, because I have to take into account account the amount of uh, just stress day to day during this week. Right. Especially Um, if you don't have access to a weight room too. Yeah. And you know, like maybe maybe that is just a better time to focus on the rowing, do some extra mobility recovery sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, Challenge their movement development. There's a, there's a lot of creative things that you can do just for general movement without getting into those high fatigue training situations. Yeah, so about. It, it's a great opportunity in that type of situation to start being like, okay, here's what we've been working on up to this point. All right, what's the next progression? Like, where do I want them to go? And then start taking time to teach them, right? Because if it's the next step in progression, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. So if we go from a split squat to now we're at a rear foot elevated, now I'm challenging the balance even more. You might not be doing more reps, right? But now all of a sudden you, you, you've made the, the complexity higher, all right? So that's a great way at that point in that environment to, to start introducing a higher level skill, all right? So that kind of sets you up. So that way when you come back and you're in your normal training schedule, you're hitting the ground running. Yep. Um, where do you find the balance in developing like muscular endurance, which from what I understand is higher reps, <coughs> lower to moderate weight? and not risking overuse mm-hmm. uh that's a good question the question by the way just for anybody in the back is developing muscular endurance while avoiding those overuse conditions from mm-hmm. rowing uh that's a really beneficial time for the periodization plan mm-hmm. when if we're doing less rowing training then we can afford to do higher volumes in the gym okay. so that we're not doubling up on those on those stressors uh in general do you do much over over twenty reps on a, on just about anything? Uh, it'll depend. Uh, uh, like if I'm doing accessory work at the end of the session, um, then it's in that twenty, thirty, fifty rep range. Um, Isolation exercises, smaller yeah. stuff, the YWT raises, face pulls, pull apart, scapular muscles. Those right are right those are a lot stuff. of yeah. PT based exercises where we're really working on muscular endurance, stability, stabilization. So that's you got to take in the mindset. Okay. Now we're trying to make sure the athlete's not breaking down in the last quarter of the race, right? That's the endurance component, right? So we do do that from like a, from a core standpoint, from a muscular standpoint, like when fatigue sets in, that's when they start losing their ability to maintain good technique, right? So we got to build that up. So we're trying to target a lot of those stabilizer muscles around the big primary movers. So that's when we would do a lot of that muscular endurance work where you're doing your three or four sets of YTWLs where you're doing your 90-90 external rotation uh, or ball drops, you know, where they're doing a lot of dynamic stabilization for the rotator cuff and the shoulder sets of 50. So 50 here, 50 here, 50 at 90-90, 50 across. So that's a lot of what I've seen some of my PT colleagues do in the clinic with a, you know, anywhere from 14 to 32 ounce a uh, little med ball. It's about, you know, the size of a grapefruit or an orange right here. Drop, catch, drop, catch. So, 
you know, it's teaching the, the rotator cuff to stabilize. So if you think about in the rowing shell, I'm coming out around the pin at the catch, I'm putting that blade in. It might be flat conditions. It might be windy. I don't know. Like I need this to set into the shoulder socket, right? That's the, the point of the rotator cuff is to help to centrate the head of the humerus into the shoulder socket, right? So that's what we want. And it's, it's pretty hard to overtrain on high rep YWTs right. in the same way that it's pretty easy to overtrain on sets of 25 on squats. Yeah. Uh, so for those big compound free weight full body exercises, for the most part, we're doing entirely force capacity and peak power work. And then I would rather yeah. spare the athlete to do their muscular endurance work, cross training or on the erg or on the water. Um, so for the, for, for the most part, we're focused on developing, uh, peak, peak force and peak power and peak strength in the gym with support for those smaller, mu smaller muscular groups. Uh, and then we're working with the rowing coaches for either cross training or, or, or rowing training to develop muscular endurance. And it, just to finish that thought, if you're doing those types of exercises, keep in mind, they're, they're always going to be lower threshold. So even, even when we were talking about the YTWs earlier, at the most, I think you said five pounds for some of his advanced athletes, right? Almost every single exercise I've seen for the last two and a half years in the clinic that the PTs are doing are either body weight or very light resistance loads and high repetitions, anywhere from 20 to 50 reps, right? So it's, it's muscular endurance. You're working on that motor control aspect. And it's low systemic stress. Exactly. So we're, we're less concerned about, about, uh, about nervous system overload. Exactly. Time. One of the things I do is work with the juniors for the winter training program, and I love the kids to, over the course of three, four months, um, get them to do a push up. Somebody, especially even boys, sometimes can't do a push up. So, but even if they can do one push up at the end of the day, they're in three sessions. I finally got a squat, squat rack with a pull up on. I want to transfer that. Do you have any tips for, for some kids starting yeah. out that can't? This is one. This is what we were talking about this morning while while doing some chin ups yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Uh, the the common chin up fault is the athletes at, at a dead hang position, and then they're simply not strong enough to develop force from that. Get the shoulder blade back and down, so they shove the trap up, and then they end up really far away from the bar. So they're they're out here like this with the, with the shoulders up. Um, what what we find most effective for starting out with athletes is a you could use a resistance band. To, to make it easier at the bottom for them, and then it, you get less assistance as, as you go up towards the top, um, where your mechanical advantage is higher. So that could be a nice way to do it. We'll also do it um, where you jump up to the top and then do like a timed hold up there, focusing on that shoulder back and down position, not up in this upward rounded position. Uh, and then we'll progress that to a slow eccentric. So once they're at the top, then we'll have them slowly lower, again, constantly cueing that shoulder back and down position, and then eventually getting up to doing full reps. You could do full reps uh, with the jumping. So just get down to the bottom, jump your way up, lower your way down as slow as you can, jump your way back up, uh, and then gradually give yourself less of a jump as, as you need a little bit less. So that's, that, that's a great way to be able to progress those exercises. Uh, so a couple additional thoughts for you on that. Um, so I'm a big proponent of your setup as your first rep. So if you're working on push-up or chin-up, before they even start going through the full range of motion, like can they get into the top position? So really coaching up hand position, right? So is the wrist, elbow, shoulder stacked? So if we're talking about the, the chin up or pull up, get, teach them the hollow position from the floor, right? That gymnastics position where they're getting into that kind of spoon shape. So if I'm on the floor, all right, I'm maintaining lumbar contact with the floor, tucking my pelvis posteriorly, Right, I'm gonna lift my, my shoulders, my abdominals are engaged. So I'd start here, and then I get here, right? And then eventually I progress here to where I have the bar over my head. Like I'm holding the bar above my head. And so, without going into pelvic rotation there. Right, right? That's so that's all abdominal tension. holding me up. So then if I'm at the bar here, right, I'm kind of pointing my toes forward, squeezing my glutes, squeezing my, my quadriceps, getting my abdominals engaged, and then I'm going through that. So just doing hollow holds from the bar or a flexed arm hold from the top of the bar, 45 to 60 seconds is a good benchmark. Usually if they can hold themselves above the bar, they're at a point where they can start to do one chin up. Vary the grip, so hammer or neutral grip, chin up, pull up or overhand grip is going to be the most challenging. Um, and then what I've done a lot of is um, start with the easier hand variations 
and get them up over the bar. So give them as much assistance as they need, but not any more than you have to. So for those, it's okay if they're kind of really working hard, but get them for a lot of athletes, the beginning part, like at the bottom where we would use that band, get them going. And then once they get to the elbow breaking, they're usually okay. It's that initial part of the pool that's the most difficult. Work with elite level athletes, what are, if you notice any patterns or if it's more individual, like when you're like, ah, oh, you're at the strength and you're getting away with it because you're an elite level athlete, but like something like that is weak. How did nobody ever address that? Gaps to fill for sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> our, our best guy on the Portuguese team is kind of like that. Um, he's kind of, you know, some of the best athletes are the best compensators. Uh, he's hypermobile. So like he likes to stretch, but it's not good for him. So he can like, you know, bend over and palm the floor, hyperextend his knees, hyperextend his elbows. So for him, it's like all about control through all of his joint segments. Um, he happens to be like, you know, our most powerful athlete. So for him, it's a lot about um, making sure he's doing the right things in terms of uh, the work in the gym. Um, he's already a pretty powerful guy. We just got to make sure he's staying like healthy. Um, did you have like something specific, like a certain area? Or? Yeah, I was just curious if yeah. like, you saw like a pattern, like, oh, everybody's terrible at moving laterally. No, or, no, it's not <laughs> like one thing. It, they're all going to sort of have their, their uh, way to compensate. Um, it'll be a little bit more specific, you know, to them. But um, like I said, the, usually the, the athletes that are kind of towards the top, they're really good compensators. They'll find a way to, to get it done want them to do it but we can always work to fill those gaps yeah without becoming overbearing about mm -hmm. it so we don't want to sort of fill their heads so much with weakness 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 that that they forget what they can actually no. do to go perform on the water um, so it's about again having that sort of periodization balance of like let's work in the off season fill the gaps as they get closer to, to to their racing time okay we'll back off and see where you're at pick it up again the next time